In the headlines, Dominica's health authorities to develop climate-driven early warning systems for health outbreaks, no injury or loss of life following a fire in Newtown on Tuesday night, and residents of Dubla promised the start of construction of a sea defense wall before the end of the year. I am Andrea Louis with the Channel 5 News, back with the details after this. Thank you for staying with us. First up, a study has identified the need for Dominica's health authorities to develop a climate-driven early warning systems for health outbreaks. This would require using climate services to predict infectious diseases. A team of research doctors from universities within the U.S. and England conducted the study and interviewed local public health practitioners during the course of the exercise. One of the researchers, assistant professor of medicine at the State University of New York Medical Center, Dr. Anna Stewart, presented the results at a workshop hosted by the Environmental Health Department on Wednesday. What we learned from the interviews is that people in the health sector use climate information in the sense that planning revolves around the dry and wet seasons. However, climate information such as data from the meteorological services or reports or bulletins are not formally integrated into most decision-making or planning processes. We asked people, do you know what is an early warning system for epidemics? And most said yes. But then we asked, are there early warning systems for Aedes aegypti in your jurisdiction? People were not sure about, how, you know, 42% said yes, 42% said no. So we need to have these uh, the climate information that's available be presented in such a way that can be easily incorporated into health planning and decision making. The study also spotlighted how the impact of tropical storm Erica has increased the spread of vector-borne diseases. The key risk factors that were identified by the people we spoke to was the increase in water storage following tropical storm Erica. I think this is really critical point here, and you, I think, understand this much better than I do. But following the storm, there are damages to the piped water supply, uh, the rivers were contaminated, and so people did not have access to piped water. They began to store water. And this is in a country which historically has had quite good access to clean, fresh water. And so people began storing water after 2015, but that behavioral change has continued today and has increased the vulnerability of the population to the emergence of new vector-borne diseases. Uh, and I know there's a PAHO-funded project today to begin to develop covers for water drums. Um, but this is a major, major concern. A key recommendation of the study is setting up standards and protocols in order to integrate climate services for health. Climate and health, in many cases, is not formally part of uh, the mandate because there are not formal agreements between the health sector and the climate sector. There are no formal agreements in place, for example, with the National Met Service and the Ministry of Health. This may be less true here in Dominica than in Barbados. In terms of where we go from here, we need to think about creating integrated and accessible data from weather, weather and climate, epidemiological, entomological data, also information on land use, census, any information that we can integrate together into these types of uh, climate services for health. In related news, a regional project has brought practitioners in the climate and health sectors together to learn how to develop a health climate framework with focus on mosquito-borne diseases. This is part of a USAID-funded program called Building Regional Climate Capacity for the Caribbean. The Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology and the Global Framework for Climate Services are involved in the project. The Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology guides its member states in setting up climate early warning systems. You might find that something that affects agriculture would have knock-on effects to help because food security is an important aspect of maintaining a population's health. Safe water is important in maintaining a country's health. Meantime, Acting Director of Primary Health Care, Dr. Laura Esprey, says the incidence of vector-borne diseases has forced health authorities to explore creative ways to address the issue. Now, if you remember chikungunya and Zika from the year 2013 to about 2015, 
and dengue fever, which is now endemic in Dominica, these are transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito and have negatively impacted the health of the national population. We are yet again threatened by another disease, yellow fever, which continues to affect some countries in our region and emphasizing the need for health systems to find innovative measures to prevent and reduce the impact of these diseases on the health of our citizens. Dr. Esprit says the Ministry of Health welcomes an early warning system as it would strengthen their capacity in monitoring the Aedes aegypti mosquito population. It is expected that this model would provide an outlook for spatial and temporal distribution of populations of Aedes aegypti using climate information for Dominica needed to guide the implementation of control measures for diseases that are spread by this mosquito. In other top stories, a survivor of Tuesday's early evening fire in Newtown was left in disbelief as the unfortunate event hits home. Tasia Abraham, along with her children and her boyfriend's family, had to flee their home while a nearby dilapidated house was on fire. That house and everything inside were completely destroyed. The fire and ambulance services responded within minutes of receiving the call and no injuries were reported. It says investigations into the fire are ongoing. Abraham, who did not want to appear on camera, managed to secure the belongings of her family. However, this is not the first time her family has been met with tragedy. A few years ago, Abraham and her family lost their possessions when they resided in another nearby building. I see the fire, so I start to cry because in 2014, we had a fire, everything burned. And 2017, again, fire again. According to the Fire and Ambulance Services, two nearby buildings, including the one where Abraham lived, were slightly damaged. It said minor damage was done to the guttering and face of boards of one building and scorching damage to the external wall of another. On to other developments, residents of the West Coast community of Diubla have been reassured that government is taking steps to protect their lives and livelihoods. While speaking to a group of fishermen from the community on Monday, Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt disclosed that plans are being put in place to construct a sea defense wall to protect the community from the effects of heavy sea swells. The government intends on building a major sea defense wall in Dublin. And I have said to the power rep that I want this wall to commence this year because we have a challenge here in Dubla with the sea surge. And I have come to accept, notwithstanding my urging, I have come to accept that there are many of us here in Dubla who will not want to leave Dubla to go on any mountain top to live or away from the sea. As regards residential structures for the people of Dubla, the Prime Minister revealed that this is also on the cards. However, the design of the buildings will be different. You will see us coming in a big way to addressing the housing situation. But we have a land issue, as you know, in Dublin. And our efforts to build individual homes, we have to, re we have to re revisit that approach and look at the possibility of building apartments mm -hmm. in, in Dublin. Because you just do not have the land space to build individual homes. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the concept of apartments, and we'll come back to you before the end of the year to share with you some of the designs that we have already and, and, and to get your understanding with it. Mr. Skerritt also spoke to some of the more specific concerns brought forth by the fishermen and said that some of these will receive direct attention following the presentation of the 2017-2018 national budget scheduled for 27th of July. As you say, um, we, so we're committing to the, we well, finish this on its way. We will come into the locker rooms, that's a, that's a given, to the, to the two fishing boats and the two other motors, that's a pro. We will speak to the owners of the Fairtrade building. If it's available, if the price is reasonable, we can move to acquire. And the, 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 the jetty and so on, we can, we'll see how we can incorporate it into the um, construction of the sea defense wall once we start it. That, that absolutely is a, is a, is a need. Coming up, scenes from the official funeral of former parliamentarian Nicholson A. N. Ducre. Stay with us.
The sons and other relatives of Nicholson Alexander Ducre carrying his coffin into church for his official send-off on Wednesday afternoon. His Excellency Charles Savre, Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt and other cabinet members attended the funeral of the former Member of Parliament. Opposition parliamentarians were also in attendance. According to information from the office of the Prime Minister, Ducre first contested elections in 1957 for the Rosa North Electorate District and won his seat as an independent candidate as no political party contested the elections then. He was the youngest individual at that time to be voted as parliamentary representative of the Rosa North constituency in opposition. He first served as Minister for Trade and Production in a Labour Party government in the 1960s and as the Minister for Trade and Industry in a subsequent term. He retired from active politics in 1970 after losing his seat. Ducre passed away on the 1st of July at age 87. In other news, the Bureau of Gender Affairs is now better positioned to raise awareness on the issue of domestic and gender-based violence around the country. This, as the Bureau's response mechanism to gender-based violence was strengthened through a series of workshops funded by the Canada Fund for Local Initiative. We had several activities under that project. Um, one was the strengthening of our NGOs. We had a retreat for our non-government organizations um, at Rosalie Bay, you know, just working with them and seeing how we could work collaboratively, collaboratively. Because at the end of the day, we have the same goal, to stop gender-based violence in Dominica. Um, another activity that we had, we had a gender training, a three-day gender training with UWE, um, lecturers from UWE Cave Hill in Barbados, um, IGDS campus. Um, and the, for this training, we targeted 35, 35 participants, um, as well as 13 stakeholder organizations. Um, another activity we had was a domestic violence training, and we had Mrs. Silly Burke from Grenada, um, from the Legal Aid and Counseling Clinic in Grenada. And through that training, through that training um, we had a, a few police officers, so we were able to teach them on how to deal with domestic violence victims. Morgan noted that there has been an increase in the number of people accessing services from the Bureau as a result of its awareness campaigns. In recent time, in 2016, we actually had a 68% increase in persons coming to the Bureau accessing counseling services. So we hope that in future, at the end of 2017, we can see a further increase. And this will also be a result of an increased public awareness. What we also want to see, um, which will, we keep working on is a strengthened response mechanisms or strengthened support systems for victims of domestic violence or victims of gender-based violence or victims of child abuse. And we've seen that increase because persons are more aware of their rights right now. Persons are more aware of their human rights. They feel more comfortable coming to report the abuse. Um, so it's not necessarily an increase in the amount of, of, of the amount of cases reported, but more persons being aware and more persons being willing to take action and more persons feeling more comfortable coming to speak about it and report the incident. The Research and Program Development Coordinator gave a breakdown of the reports for the June 2011 to December 2016 period. When we look at the men, um, we have more than 90% of men come forward to report emotional and, and psychological abuse. Um, when we look at the women, oh, we, do, we notice that about 86% are more likely to report physical or sexual abuse. 25.6% um, of all reported cases of gender-based violence are intimate partner violence. That's violence within relationships. And um, when we look at children, which um, the PS alluded to earlier, we see 56% 56 56 are child abuse cases. The Bureau also plans to launch infomercials and an anti-gender-based violence book in order to help spread awareness on gender-based violence. On to the fishing sector, fishermen from the community of Dubla are being challenged to be more serious about their trade in order to reap significant financial rewards. The words came from Minister for Trade Ian Douglas when he addressed fishermen during a meeting in Dubla earlier this week. He informed them that there are markets for local fish. However, Dominica is falling short in meeting the demands. We have people from Totola. There's a Dominican guy doing business in Totola. He comes to Dominica to buy fresh produce every two weeks with $40,000 in his pocket. And one of the things that he's looking for is 
every between every two weeks he wants between three and five thousand pounds of fish frozen fish to be exported to Totola. and that is an opportunity in fact we cannot get that right now we're begging the postman fishermen the archipelagic species that you speak about here you guys are maybe experts on that when we talk about yellowfin tuna and we talk about marlin and we talk about doad i i'm not sure if there are more fishermen in Dominica who can rival the Jubla fishermen when it comes to the archipelagic. The Trade Minister further advised the fishermen to make a concerted effort towards getting insurance as the job they do has its risks. And the conservation of rivers in Dominica has hit another milestone. Local advocacy group World Rivers Day Committee has been observing the United Nations World Rivers Day since the year 2005. World Rivers Day is about creating increased public awareness on the importance of rivers and improved stewardship of the natural resource. Following a consultation of stakeholders on Monday, the Dominica Association of Local Community Authorities, or DALCA, is tasked with leading a formal river conservation effort known as the Adopt a River Program. According to the World Rivers Day Committee, the immediate task for DALCA is to coordinate the observance of World Rivers Day 2017 on 24 September. Dominica has joined Trinidad in launching the Adopt a River Program. In June, personnel from the Adopt a River program of Trinidad and Tobago held training for their local counterparts. This is, is what it, it's all about. For example, in Trinidad, by adopting and monitoring the river, they come to realize 65% of the water sources in Trinidad is polluted. They are polluted. Now, my question for us is, well, we talk about 606, 365 rivers. Okay, we bathe, and when we bathe in the rivers, we drink the water in the river. Do we know what we are drinking? Hmm? Are we sure that the water that we bathe in are unpolluted? So that is the whole purpose of the Adopt the River program. In the initial stage, the rivers at Hampstead, Roseau, Belfast and Rosalie will be given priority focus. Under the program, individuals are tasked with identifying a river or a section of a river, organizing a team and developing a conservation project, among other processes aimed at enhancing the river. That's news, your sports highlights next with Kenny Williams. First up in sports, six talented footballers here will benefit from sports scholarships at various tertiary level institutions in the U.S. soon. In January, seven players took part in the Free Kick College Player Showcase in St. Lucia, which bore fruit to date. President of the Harlem Football Club, Don Leogel, says plans are in the pipeline to make this an annual event. We are in constant discussion with the president of the Free Kick Foundation as we aim to make this an annual event and plans are in place to have a chapter established in Dominica. So the young footballers present here today start getting prepared for this opportunity. Meantime, Senator Honorable Robert Tung, speaking on behalf of the Prime Minister, commended the athletes on their achievements. You have also proven yourself as academic achievers because not only just sports, so also you have to have good grades to be able to be part of this. So again, congratulations to you. You have made your friends proud. You have made your clubs proud. You have made your parents proud. You have made your schools proud. But most importantly, you have made yourselves proud. We encourage you to remain focused in your academic and sports um, pursuits. You have received partial scholarships and the balance has to be paid by your parents. Your sports club has actually written to the Prime Minister asking for additional support for all of the six persons here today. And the Prime Minister has approved the request by the sports club to provide you with the, other, the additional support to make the cost um, a lot less. The recipients of the scholarships are Romelcia Philip, LSU University, Montel James, Lackawanna College, Andres Joseph, Concordia University, Fitz Jolly, Lackawanna College, 
Aliatit Essex Country College, and Giles Mitchell LSU Men's Program. The athletes were chosen on the basis of their being under 20 years of age, finished high school and possibly university. The Dominican athletes competed among a pool of 50 student athletes from Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Kitts, Grenada and Antigua and Barbuda to get the scholarships. Meantime, football coaches here will benefit from a three-day course complement the Dominica Football Association. The inaugural D-licensed coaching course was designed by the technical staff of DFA and targets coaches at the novice level. The aim of the three-day course, which commences on Friday, 21st July 2017, is to equip new coaches with the necessary skills and competences needed to develop the game at the club and national level. The course content will cover a total of five modules, which include the DFA's vision for football development on the island, the coach, the football environment, and coaching the Caribbean player. The three-day event will include a few practical sessions as well. Following the successful completion of the course, the individuals will receive their local D license. Technical Director Jerome Badwill and the National Senior Men's Coach Rajesh Joseph Lachu will serve as lead instructors. Badwill and Lachu will be assisted by Geoff Faustin and Wayne George who serve as Youth Development Officer and Women's Coordinator respectively. All clubs are expected to be represented by one representative to the three-day course. This initiative forms part of the DFA's four-year strategic development plan, which makes provision for coaching education. The next phase of the course is expected to target sports teachers at the various school levels here and academies. On the cricket scene, West Indies on the 19s finished the tour of South Africa on top to beat the home team by two runs in the fifth one-day international on Wednesday. Batting first, West Indies reached 244 for five in their 50 overs. Keegan Simmons contributed an undefeated 107 with Joshua out on 46 and Dominica's Alec Athanas 40. Set 245 for the win, South Africa just couldn't get the runs in time and finished on 242 for seven in their 50 overs. Matthew Britsky contributed 100 to his team's total. Baskar Yadram took 3 for 37 runs and Jevor Royal 2 for 31. West Indies won the series 3-2. Meantime, rainfall affected play in Dominica's most recent encounter of the 2017 Sir Garfield Sobers Cricket League, which forced the abandonment of play. Playing against Sir Everton Week's Centre of Excellence under 17s, Dominica had some play possible before the game was called off to reach 50 for four wickets in 16.5 overs batting first. Scoring for Dominica combined schools, Lester Sluis 18 not out and Nigel John Luis 11 not out. Moving on to track and field where Usain Bolt has confirmed he will run his last races before retirement in August. The track superstar will run the 100 meter and 4 by 100 meter relay at the World Championships in London in August. The eight-time Olympic gold medalist and icon of world sport lived one of the most illustrious careers in the history of athletics. Bolt said his aim is to win in London and to retire on a winning note. The World Championships take place from 4th to 13th August. The men's 100m final is scheduled for Saturday 5th August, while the men's 4x100m relay, which will mark the end of Bolt's career, takes place Saturday August 12th. In June, he ran for the final time on home soil, clocking 10.03 seconds to win the Salute a Legend 100m race. Before London, he will also compete in the 100m at the Diamond League event in Monaco on Friday. Sports continues with this item where President of Dominica Football Association, Glenn Etienne, is reiterating the call for clubs to invest in the youth since they are the future of Dominica's football product. He says the staging of the under-15 football league was a success and encourages all clubs to get their house in order for the upcoming under-17 competition. In the initial year, clubs were not mandated to have a youth team attached. But moving forward and at the start of this season, the DFA will make it mandatory for all clubs to have a youth setup. Such a setup will ensure sustainability of the clubs and the future of Dominica's football. In the not too distant future, it will also be mandatory for all clubs to have a women team attached. 
preferably at the youth level. These mandatory moves are crucial if we are to make any progress as a football nation. When the under-17 league kicks off next week, only clubs with a youth program will allow to participate. The under-15 league, which was staged this year, was a tremendous success. As of Saturday, there were 10 registered clubs for the under-17 league. That's all the sporting highlights for now. Join us next time. Stay tuned for your midweek weather forecast. Good evening, viewers. Thanks for joining us for this evening weather broadcast. I am your presenter, Malaika Laron. First, taking a look at satellite imagery, and what we see is an area of cloudiness associated with a trough system that is expected to affect the area by tomorrow. Also, this area of convection associated with a tropical wave is expected to approach the Lesser Antilles by weekend. Visible satellite imagery show partly cloudy to cloudy skies over Dominica today. Radar imagery shows scattered showers across most of the Lesser Antilles today, and some showers is approaching from the east. Tonight weather is expected to be partly cloudy to cloudy and hazy with a few scattered showers. Tomorrow the weather is expected to be mostly cloudy and hazy with a few scattered showers. Sea conditions is expected to be moderate with waves peaking near 7 feet. For the next three days, expect partly cloudy skies with a few scattered showers on Friday and on Saturday, expect partly cloudy to cloudy skies with a few scattered showers by afternoon. For the rest of the Caribbean, expect mostly cloudy skies with a few scattered showers across most of the Les Antilles with a relative improvement to the southern portion of the island chain. On the international scene, expect partly cloudy skies in New York, thunderstorm activity in Miami, Caracas and Beijing, and cloudy skies with a few scattered showers can be expected in London. High temperatures can be expected in New York and Beijing. The sun will rise tomorrow at 5.44 a.m. and will set at 6.39 p.m. Please remember we are in the hurricane season. For more information, contact us at 447-5555 or visit our website at weather.gov.dm. Thanks for viewing and have a pleasant night. To end the news, the headlines again. Dominica's health authorities to develop climate-driven early warning systems for health outbreaks. No injury or loss of life following a fire in Newtown on Tuesday night. And residents of Dubla promised the start of construction of a sea defense wall before the end of the year. Feel free to contact us at news at marpin2k4.com. You can also access our past newscasts on our YouTube channel. On behalf of the entire production team, I am Andrea Louis, and to all of our viewers around the world, thank you so much for watching. Join us tomorrow.